as you can see, you can probably read my name. My name is Claire Steele and my partner here, business partner, co-founder of Eltonics is Sarah. She might be left right up down. There she is. Hi, everyone. And um, I can see loads of people from different parts of the world. That's absolutely lovely. Isn't that brilliant? I've seen someone from Porto, which is just literally down the road from me in Portugal. And Sarah, you're based in Athens, aren't you? Yes. So I'm originally from Wales and now I live in Athens in, in Greece. So welcome to everybody. We're so happy that you could attend this webinar with us. Absolutely. OK, so the webinar is, as you probably know, because you've signed up for it, increasing the challenge in the teenage classroom. So what we're going to do now is put our seatbelts on because we're about to look at our flight path for today. We're gonna to go on a big journey together. So the first thing we're gonna do, the first aim of our session is understanding the difference between mastery and developmental tasks. Then, we move on to reflecting on our use of questioning uh, to encourage high order thinking skills. And then finally, we're going to be looking at encouraging learners to choose the level of challenge for themselves. So if we look at the confidence thermometer there, where are you, do you think, on that confidence thermometer? <clears throat> Are you at the bottom? You need a little bit of help with this, which is fine. That's OK. Do you think, mm, OK, I'm OK with these. I'm, I've, I've completed it. I understand. Or do you think you can actually teach this for, to someone else? Your confidence levels are through the roof. Where do you think you are on your flight path so far? All right, then. So, Claire, first of all, we're going to understand the difference between mastery and developmental tasks. And Claire, I'm going to show you something super scary. Are you ready? Oh, uh, yeah. OK. Here it is. E, what is it? That is the Jabberwock. You are totally right. It's the Jabberwock. And what can you tell me about it based on the picture? Oh, I'd say um, it lives in a forest, a cold forest. It's mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty scary. It's got big, sharp teeth and big claws uh -huh. and red eyes and looks a bit angry, possibly yeah. hungry, a bit, bit hangry. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You wouldn't like to meet this monster on a dark night, would you? Definitely not. Not even during the day. No, no, no. OK, OK. So... I've got some questions to ask you, Claire, about the, the Jabberwock, this, this horrendous monster. And you can choose the question, okay? Now, this question is not very spicy, mm -hmm. okay? but this question is super spicy. What level of spiciness would you like to try? I'll go quite spicy. I'll go two, two chilies. Two chilies, okay. Yeah. So your question is... What does it eat? Oh, okay. Um, small animals, or maybe uh -huh. something bigger, maybe humans. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you think that question was spicy enough? Could you go spicier? I could. I could supersize it. I could. Could you? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So the supersized spices, how yeah. does it sound? <laughs> <laughs> I get you want me to do that? Okay. Yes. Um, meow. No. Uh, lovely, lovely. And do you think that was the right level of spiciness for you? Yes. Yeah, yeah you I answered it, that. didn't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to show you the first part of the story about the Jabberwock. Okay? okay. Here it is. This is the first part of the story. And I'd like you to read it and answer these three questions, okay? And participants, feel free to write the answers in the chat as well, if you want to. So the first question is, what were the slicey toves doing in the wave? Mm. The second question is, how would you describe the state of the borough groves? And the third question, is what can you say about the Momraths? So take your time, read through 
and see if you can answer the questions and participants feel free to write your answers in the chat as well. Yes, please help me. Okay. Um, okay, number one, mm -hmm. I think they were gyring and gimbling in the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, number two, I would describe the state of the Borogoves. I would say they're mimsy. Lovely. And what can I say about the Mombas? I'd say they outgrabe. Aha. All right. Good. Now, Claire, you said the Borogoves were mimsy. So what do you think mimsy means? Uh, super scared. Very scared. Very scared. Another word for very scared terrified absolutely absolutely and what about borrow groves what do you think the borrow groves are um, small animals animals mm -hmm. okay okay the momraths uh, humans maybe <laughs> right right and out grave what do you think that means run okay and we've got run, some lovely run. answers in the chat as well now Based on what you said, Claire, I've got some more questions for you. So were the borough groves right to feel mimsy? If so, why? And if not, why not? And finally, how effective was the Momrath's strategy? Take your time to answer. Okay. Were the borough groves right to feel mimsy? Mimsy meaning you scared, terrified. Yes, absolutely. I would feel terrified if I saw that thing creeping up on me in a yeah. cold forest at night. <laughs> sure. That's where I hang out at night in the cold <laughs> forest. And um, five, how effective was, was the Mama strategy to outgrade, to run? Uh, I probably would run as well, but I don't yeah. think it's a, an effective strategy. I think. Ah, that, why not? Uh, the, the big monster will just, it's so big, it will just kind of grab you and eat you. Okay, so what would you do instead? I'd probably have a little chat with it. Say, <laughs> right. say I'm friendly. Okay, uh, okay. Don't eat me, I'm okay. Okay. Now, Claire, when I did this lesson with my teenage students, the next thing I asked them to do was to have a look at portmanteau words. So the Jabberwocky is a poem by Lewis Carroll, right? And he introduces these portmanteau words. And portmanteau words is when you put two words together, you squish them together and you make a new word. For example, Claire, in the beginning, you said the Jabberwocky was hungry and angry and yeah. you made a portmanteau word. You said he was, or Hang it was? Hangry. Hangry, all yeah. right. Would become? Uh, spork. Spork, yeah, absolutely. And then I asked my students to play a game of bingo with these portmanteau words that you can see in the table at the bottom. Mm. And then they came up with their own portmanteau words. So they created new words. Uh, so they're applying what they've learned and created and created new words with that. That's it. They learned. apply and yeah. they create. And we're going to come back to those verbs later on in the session. Then I asked my students to predict what happens next in the poem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is where they're analysing and speculating. Exactly. And then I divided my students into groups and pairs and gave them each verse with some missing words and they then created new nonsense words or they put their portmanteau words into the into the verse to to create a whole verse uh, okay so so some groups have got some words other groups have got they've got different kind of level of challenge there is that right absolutely yes so there's differentiation going on here you can see that group one have got three words that they need to put in whereas group five have got just one and that really depends on the comfort level of the students in doing this kind of task yeah. based on what I knew about my students so yeah. You use, class some verbs to describe what the students did. For example, you said apply, create, analyze, and speculate, right? Yeah. 
Exactly, and I think it's really useful to use verbs to reflect on our lessons. Mm. So if we look at the revised version 2001 of Bloom's taxonomy, we can see those six main verbs on the pyramid. We've got remember, understand and apply. And these are the lower order thinking skills. And then we've got analyze, evaluate and create, which are your higher order thinking skills. Uh -huh. And then we have verbs associated with those. So we've, if we look at remember at the bottom, we've got verbs associated with this, like recall, repeat, memorize, duplicate. Then we move up to understand. And this is where students are now explaining ideas or concepts. So classify, describe, locate, recognize are some of the verbs there. We move up to apply, which is still lower order thinking skills, but higher on the spectrum. This is where students are using information in new situations. So verbs associated with this, solve, demonstrate, interpret, operate then analyze we're getting now up into higher order thinking skills analyze this is where students are now drawing connections among ideas so we've got organize compare contrast distinguish question experiment all these lovely verbs here we move up to evaluate and this is where students are justifying a stand or decision. So verbs associated with this, critique, judge, argue, appraise. And then right at the top, then personally, my favorite is create. And this is where students are now producing a new or original work. So design, assemble, develop, formulate like the Jabber work, when you ask the students to apply their knowledge and create new words, that's, that's what we're talking about here. So really this Bloom's taxonomy is a spectrum of task difficulty, okay? And what we mean by task is anything from a, uh, a teacher asking a student and the students answering it in class, or it could be us assigning a task, for the, for the lesson, or it could be a longer term project or assignment. Now, these lower order thinking skills can also be described as mastery tasks. And the higher order thinking skills can also be described as developmental tasks. So if we look at mastery tasks at the bottom, these are usually done in a short period of time and they allow the less able students to succeed, therefore reducing the chance of them giving up and losing motivation. Then we move up to the developmental tasks and this really involves the skills required for progression to the next educational level. This stretches more able learners and creates deep thinking uh, or real understanding in other words okay so Sarah yeah. I'm going to show you some descriptions that right either mastery or developmental tasks and uh -huh. then can you match them in the right place the pressure's on then yeah. so participants please please help me out with this if you want to if you want to say something in the chat then please do okay um right so we've got a usually part of our scaffolding well i guess that's mastery tasks Perfect. right because they they help scaffold the developmental tasks which might happen later in in the lesson okay they are fairly easy involving knowledge and comprehension well you said mastery tasks uh involve lower order thinking skills allow yeah. all students to achieve so i guess that's mastery yeah um not all students will be able to achieve the task fully that must be developmental that's right and is that okay claire that not all the students will be able to achieve the task fully absolutely it's part of differentiation yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, involve higher order thinking skills. Well, that's definitely uh, developmental tasks. Super. Uh, all students should be able to find the answer, then mastery tasks. Yeah. So you said so that um, less able students in a, in a particular situation won't give up. They are often dependent on prior learning. So that must be developmental because the prior learning is perhaps what they do at the mastery level, right? Excellent. Yes, yeah, the part of scaffolding. Yep. Yep. Okay. They can be achieved in a short time. Mastery. Yep. Good. Uh, they are not dependent on prior learning. So this must also be mastery. Yep. Involve lower order thinking skills. Mastery. Have you got any room left with mastery? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. And then they are more difficult. It has to be a uh, developmental. Is that right, Claire? Absolutely perfect. Okay. So what you're saying then is that in any lesson that we teach, mm. we have to have a mixture of both mastery and developmental tasks in there, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if we look at your Jabberwock lesson, okay, in a little bit more detail. Uh huh. We've got this chart here on on the on in the first column. You've got what I did or what the students would do in your class, and then as you can see in the next column, we've got whether they're mastery or developmental tasks, and you can right. see there's a mix of both there. And of course, as the as the lesson progresses. You're, you're getting more difficult, more challenging, more developmental tasks. The next column along is where that is on Bloom's taxonomy. So those six main verbs on the spectrum there, understand, understand and apply those lower order thinking skills, moving up to more hots, you evaluate, create, evaluate. And then, on, in the very last column there, we've got the, the verbs that, that are associated with, with the main verbs on the, on the spectrum. So for example, the understand, we're getting the students to describe, that's why we know it's there on that spectrum. So as you can see, there is a mix of both mastery and developmental tasks. Yeah, and just to say lots means lower order thinking skills and HOTS means higher order thinking skills. You know how we love acronyms in, in this industry. Mm -hmm. Okay then, so you've got some questions for me, right, Claire? Oh yeah, number one, right? Mm -hmm. Was there a point in that Jabberwock lesson where the students chose the level of challenge for themselves? Yes. This was the chili challenge that you did, where I asked you to choose the level of spiciness of the question. And by talking about a level of spiciness, which is quite fun anyway, right? Yes. Yeah, um, we, we also get away from this idea of something being easy or difficult, because, for example, Claire, what's easy for me might be difficult for you or yeah. what's difficult for me might be easy for you right so we kind of get away from that and then of course we can encourage students to reflect you know could I have gone a little bit more but could I have gone spicier or did I need a less spicy kind of kind of challenge there yeah and I bet I bet the, the students love that too they do yeah they do excellent uh, okay second question then was there a point in the lesson where the teacher chose the level of challenge for the students yeah so this was where um, the, the students had to complete the verses with their own kind of made up words, right? And I already knew from, from having taught my students for a, for a fairly long period of time, which students would really kind of rise to that challenge and which ones wouldn't so much. So I made sure that um, I stretched the ones that, uh, that would have found that quite easy anyway and made them complete three words and the ones who would have found that a little bit more challenging I just gave them one word to to do and you can adjust as you as you go along but it's part yeah. of your differentiation great so this is what we've done so far on our flight path we have 
hopefully understood the difference between mastery and developmental tasks. And for our lovely participants, I just want you to have a look at this confidence thermometer and just think about whether you still need a bit of help with this. And if you do, you might have some questions that you want to ask us um, in the Q&A later on whether you think okay I've completed this I understand this or whether you might even be able to teach this to somebody else for example a colleague of yours so what's next Claire what are we going to do next let's look at questioning all right we're going to look at questioning then so Claire and I observe, we have the, the privilege of observing a lot of teachers and we also record ourselves um, and our lessons, which as some of you might know is excruciatingly painful. But here are some of the questions that were asked um, by teachers that we observed and also in our lessons as well. Okay, and Claire, I want you to help me out with this. So some of these questions that you see on the bottom right hand uh, corner of the screen are procedural. In other words, they're connected to instructions, logistics, what the students have to do. Okay, some questions involve remembering. So mm -hmm. as, as we know, that's a lower order thinking skill. And some questions involve deeper thinking. All okay. right. Yeah. So what about this one? How many minutes do you have for this? That's procedural. That's a classic ICQ. Yeah, an ICQ and instruction checking question. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What's your take on the ending of the Jabberwocky? That's thinking. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. When did Amelia Earhart start flying? Uh, that's remembering a fact. So remembering, yeah. Great. Why is it important to be kind? Ah, uh, that that's a beautiful thinking question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely question, isn't it? L lots of different answers would be generated from this question. What's the past tense of bring? Uh, remember, I was gonna I was gonna answer that then. <laughs> I'm definitely remembering. <laughs> Must be my teacher's voice that I've put yeah. on. Yeah. Um, are you working alone or with a partner? Classic ICQ again. Yeah, procedural. Yeah, an instruction checking question. Who is this written for, do you think? That's thinking, yeah. Good. Did you bring your pencil case? Procedural. Yeah, good. And how many Olympian gods are there? Okay, that's recalling or remembering yeah. facts, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So if we go back then, if we revisit Bloom's taxonomy, we can kind of match up where these questions would fall on the taxonomy, right? So procedural yeah. questions involve remembering or understanding, especially in instruction. Remembering questions, obviously we're at the remember, understand level. Whereas the thinking questions that we have here pushed us up or pushed the students up to the analyze and evaluate level. Yeah, yeah. Sarah mentioned before that we have the privilege of observing teachers and also not the privilege of, a, of recording ourselves, but that's what we do. And we kind of, calculated how the percentage of of questioning that the teachers and ourselves use in class so we calculated that 60 percent of the, the questions uh delivered by the teacher encouraged the students to remember 20 percent were procedural so if we put those together that's 80 percent of the questioning in our classes as lower order thinking skills and only 20% of the questioning encouraged thinking. So immediately, if we think what will happen as a result of this, students won't be engaged as much as they could be engaged. They're operating at the lower end of Bloom's taxonomy, so lower order thinking skills, as we mentioned before. And as a result of this, teenagers just won't be sufficiently challenged or stretched. Now, there is 
a need for procedural questions, no doubt about it. It's about classroom management, etc. But I think we need to just keep in mind that a good question encourages thinking and fosters true engagement in the class. Yeah, so then I guess our next question is, how do we encourage a culture of inquiry in our teenage classrooms, right? Or it, indeed in any, of our, in any of our classrooms that really opens the minds of our teenage students, increases the level of challenge and provokes truly independent thought. So the trick is to include the following questioning strategies in our lessons. And it's super important to plan the type of question we ask and when we ask it, right? So we might start by asking closed or rapid fire questions, which really involves remembering, okay? And then these might be followed by something called hinge questions, which we'll return to in a moment which involve understanding. And these types of questions are really assessing students' learning. But we do need to get our students to answer thinking questions. And these are super important because th this is how we progress students' learning. So before we come to talk about thinking questions and how to write them, what are hinge questions, Claire? Okay, there's a point in the lesson when the teacher needs to know if, if the students have grasped a key concept. It's basically before moving on from a mastery task to a developmental task. And it's important to check the level of mastery at that hinge point in the lesson. So it's kind of like a diagnostic tool at this point. So what do hinge questions look like? They're usually multiple choice mm -hmm. and they check immediate understanding and they check all the students have understood, not just the question that the students that we call upon, one or two students, but all the students at the same time. Um, the students then respond in one to two minute time frame. Okay, so they have time to think. And then when they give their answers, the teacher needs to decide on a kind of pass rate. So for example, you might decide that if 80% of my class have got the question right, I'm gonna move on, okay? But then we've got the 20% of the class that haven't mastered that or got the key concept at that point in the lesson. So the teacher needs to decide what to do at this point, do they? put the 80% onto task and sit with the 20% and help and support them to grasp that concept in some way? Or do they implement peer teaching? So um, this will encourage more communication, more uh, student emphasis, student centeredness. It's quite effective for a language classroom as well. Motivating as well, I think, for the students. Um, we mentioned it before about avoiding a hands up approach. So basically in, in, a, in a physical classroom, instead of getting students put their hands up, we can get the students to write their answers on a whiteboard, a little whiteboard and show it. Um, maybe the students can hold up a letter uh, or a color or a number that's associated with the right answer. In a virtual setting, there might be something uh, we can set up a poll or we can, we can set up uh, voting buttons or even get the students to answer in the chat box. So, so basically, Sarah, if I wanted to ask you a hinge question about your understanding of hinge questions. Oh, putting me on the spot again, yeah. It would be this. Okay, so we've got uh -huh. a multiple choice. Hinge questions are used, A, to help the teacher explain something, B, to assess overall understanding of the concept, and C, to inform progress reports, and D, to grade students. So holding up your whiteboard or putting it in the chat box, what would your answer be? And maybe participants in the webinar can write their 
answers in the chat box as well. They're already doing so, and I'm going to steal these answers. Uh, so I'm going to go for B to assess yeah. overall understanding of a concept. Yeah, you're all right. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. So hinge questions are very different from thinking questions, aren't they? Because the thinking questions actually require higher order thinking skills. And these questions are sometimes called uh, Socratic questions. Okay. There are some examples here um, on the screen that you can have a look through. So Socratic questions are not tools for evaluation. They don't aim to us uh, to assess our learners. Rather, they're used to um, facilitate open-ended collaborative discussions and dialogues between students and students and between teachers and students as well. And unlike debates, they're not competitive in nature. So while there's definitely a place for classroom debates, these questions are not competitive, they are collaborative, and they help to further learning, deepen learning, by improving students' reasoning and analytical skills. So ideally, these questions are open-ended, they seek thoughtful responses, and students are encouraged to give evidence for their response to support their answers, which in turn brings a more in-depth examination and understanding of the ideas and concepts at hand, right? Yeah. And by engaging in the strategy, students learn to process information in a deeper manner. They learn to critically analyze, reason, rationalize information, build connections between new knowledge and past information. And then the impact of learning begins to stretch outside of the classroom and into the real world. So these questions that I've got on my board, what I do with my students is I either have them on the wall or I have them placed on the on the desk when I'm in a physical classroom or on my board so students can refer to them and use them as question prompts at any time during the during the lesson. Yeah, I like it that the, that the teacher doesn't always have the answer as well. So it's, it's this kind of beautiful dynamic in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. OK, there are techniques that we can use in class to allow more thinking when asking students questions. So the first one, um, which we mentioned before in the hinge questions is this hands down policy. So we can ask the whole class a question, choose a student to answer, or get the students to choose who to answer. And by doing this, the level of engagement is higher because basically students might be chosen at any time to answer that question. Um, second technique we've got is um, implementing a three second wait time. So you ask the question to the students, choose a student to answer, and then give three seconds, it could be more, three seconds of time to think. And the most difficult bit here is to, endure the silence, <laughs> have that, that pause, that silence in class, don't be afraid of it. It's that thinking time that the student needs to then have this opportunity to give a more developed answer. Really useful in a language class as well. Then we have our third technique, which is reversing this, flipping it, and actually giving the students the answer and getting the students to think about the question. Lovely. The other thing that we, we can do, and this is especially good for a, for a physical classroom setting, for those of you who are teaching face-to-face -face still, is to introduce a wall of wonder. My students really love this wall of wonder. So the idea is you dedicate a space in your classroom for students to ask any question that they like. And any question is a good question here. So you give students post-it notes or pens and they have to write their questions on a given topic. It could be the topic that you're exploring, you know, in the module, in the unit, in that lesson. And then students post up their, their questions very visibly 
Okay, students can then choose a question they would like to answer or a question that they can take home and do some research on and the next week they come back with the answer and this again encourages peer teaching which is really effective for our teenage learners and once again as you said Claire it gets away from that idea of of the teacher knowing all the answers right because we don't and a variation on this is the question continuum So what you would do is you put students in pairs and in groups and based on the topic that you're doing in the the classroom that day, you would get students to devise as many questions as they can. All right. On that on that topic. And then they would put the question on a point on this on this graph. So, for example, if they thought that the question was a very interesting one, they'd put it down here along the horizontal axis. If they thought it wasn't so interesting, they might put it here. If they felt that the question encouraged really deep thinking, they put it at the top of the vertical axis, which represents complexity. So if a question was super interesting and super complex, then they might put it here. And then the students would ask the questions that they place in the top right hand side of the of the graph. Right. And this kind of also encourages the 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 students to be selective about the questions that they choose to to ask and answer as well. So um, they get to choose. They they have a choice over the questions that they'd like to further explore and. It's also interesting to think about interaction patterns when it comes to questioning. So in the lessons that we observed and and in our own lessons as well, when there were questions asked in the classroom, the interaction patterns were often teacher to students and students to teachers, right? So you have this kind of dichotomy going on, but we can break this up a little bit. For example, we could use the pose, pause, pounce, pounce technique. You can PPPB it. This is when the teacher poses a question or indeed a student can pose a question. There's a pause. As Claire said, there's a three second or more waiting time. Okay. Then you pounce on a student to answer the question. Student A is going to answer this question. But instead of immediately responding to student A's answer as the teacher, I then bounce it to student B. And student B has to respond to what what student A said. Okay, so they could either agree with it, they might disagree with it, they might add to it, and so on. Brilliant, yeah. And there's always there's also the kind of A, B, C it as well. So A meaning agree. Did you agree with what they said? B is build on. Can you build on what they said? And C is challenge. Can you challenge this idea? And of course, by doing this, this helps the learners to focus and narrow down their answers. We can also, by by doing this ABC technique, we can also introduce some functional language to help support learning language needs. So if we look look at all this lovely functional language that we can introduce, put on the wall, et cetera, that they can use while they're answering the questions. Beautiful. Lovely, lovely. And I think the ABC approach maybe gives a little bit more scaffolding to the learners right rather than the the pose pause pounce bounce so perhaps with younger teenagers you might want to abc it first and get them used to this concept yeah it's kind of learner training isn't it yeah yeah thanks claire so we've looked at so far understanding the difference between mastery and mental tasks we have now reflected on our use of questioning to encourage higher order thinking skills and once again 
uh, for our participants, if you look at the confidence thermometer, think about for the use of questioning whether you still need a bit of help with this, and that's okay, you have the opportunity to ask us some questions at the end, whether you feel like, okay, I've completed this, I understand this, or whether you could teach this to one of your colleagues. So what are we going to do next, Claire, for the final part uh, of our session today? Let's look at giving learners a choice, encouraging learners to choose their own level of challenge. All right, then. Which we've so, done a little bit of already, haven't we? Yeah, we have. So we did show you earlier the, the chili challenge. And there are times in which we as teachers differentiate activities or tasks for our learners. And we might assign a different level of challenge to different student or group of students based on what we know about them. But other times we can ask students to choose for themselves, okay? And this gives teenage learners a sense of ownership and empowerment mm -hmm. and we might be surprised as well that they might choose a higher level of challenge than we might have expected from them so this really allows us to push our students further by giving them the choice so for example in the chili challenge uh, challenge um, situation they choose the level of spiciness okay mm -hmm. and we differentiate the question based on the level of spiciness that they, they want to choose. This can be used in any type of lesson. But the important thing is to get the students to reflect. And we do that by asking the students if the challenge was spicy enough. So could they have gone spicier? Was it too spicy? And so on. The other thing that we can do is give them a choice board. Now, this is a choice board. Um, created by a teacher called Jessica Fernandez for a reading class. And what students do is they choose three tasks from the choice board that they'd like to do. Now, some of these tasks, if you can see here, this is write a poem. Um, this would be a higher order thinking skill, so a developmental task. Yeah. Or your learners might choose this, which is write a summary of the book which would be understanding, right? This would be a lower order thinking skill. So this would be a mastery task. So your learners can actually choose whether they want to do a mastery task or whether they want to do a, um, a developmental task. Finally, you could give them a menu, a menu choice. Okay. I love, I so, love this. I love this. <laughs> it does make me feel hungry, though. That's the only thing. Yeah. So um, this was from a clear lesson. And students had to choose one main dish. This is a task that they'd like to answer. They had to, they had to order two side dishes, so two tasks that they had to do. And they had to select one dessert, OK? And once again, the tasks are differentiated in each section main dish you've got uh, mastery developmental side dish you've got options mastery and developmental and so on and then of course to reflect you could always ask students if they were satisfied with their order yeah so that's it from us Thank you so much for attending our webinar. And if you do want to get in touch with us, uh, you can either email us directly at team at eltonics.com or you can join our Facebook group, um, Eltonics Connects. Uh, Paul, I'll pass it over to you now because I'm sure yeah. there are some questions. There are. I haven't really been looking, to be honest, because I've been just listening, <laughs> watching the, the, the presentation. I thought you were going to say I was just, you know, having a walk along the street and you know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> going for a coffee. Yeah. I've, out. Yeah, I've just come back. What, what did I miss? No, no, no. I've been, I've been kind of slightly engrossed in what you've been saying the whole, the whole way through. So I've, I'm just sort of looking at the questions now, and I have, I have kind of looked at a few of them. That's that's not true um there are a few i'm still trying to vary the ones between facebook because there are a few on facebook and so we can kind of engage with them a little bit and also on zoom there's quite a few i guess the question is do you want how, how spicy do you want your question to be? Um, <laughs> oh, oh hit us with the, the spicy ones okay uh this, this, this is an interesting one i mean it's okay um 
so obviously Bloom's taxonomy um, creation is the sort of the at the top of the, the pyramid. Um, so the, the question is, is, is there a stage after creation? We know there isn't a stage after creation according to Bloom's taxonomy, but here we go, this is sort of the spiciness of it. If, um, if there was a stage after creation, what, <laughs> what, what would you call it? <laughs> oh gosh Maybe. well I, I think the concept of of creators is quite a hard one anyway right and mm -hmm. and I think um what I've done as a, as a teacher in the past and have, have kind of failed is uh at the create stage I've sort of given uh students a sort of blank slate so mm -hmm. it, it might be something like me saying okay write a poem and the students go ah, I don't want to write I don't want to write a poem I don't know where to start I, mm -hmm. I think what would um, come as part of that create stage is, is introducing the concept of a couple of constraints. So you sort of give the learners a few constraints, a few boundaries within which to be creative. And that's usually a lot more successful. So for example, instead of me saying, write a poem, mm -hmm. um, you've got to write a poem where every word starts with a letter B, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think while there's, there's, there's nothing above create, we can also scaffold that create stage itself by either giving boundaries or giving students completely mm -hmm. uh, free range sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention constraints as well, because I'm a trained artist. So when, when we were like, sometimes we had to draw the person opposite us, but we had a blindfold on, you know, <laughs> it kind of creates more creation. Yeah. It yeah. reminds me of like MasterChef when they've only got two ingredients and they have to, <laughs> you know, make a fabulous a fine dining dish. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, more sort of a comment for me. I mean, I love, I love the, the way that what you've been talking about it fits so nicely with the kind of the, the sort of multi-level um, kind of aspect that, that exists in, in every classroom, obviously. Um, yeah. And there's kind of that sort of you know the, the menu, the choices that that they've got. So if you know if they're feeling confident, if they're not quite you know, um, then they can choose this or that. I'm just, I suppose, I'm sort of thinking as well. So I will come to questions that other people have asked, but I'm sort of a little bit interested because I know that the work. That you do obviously with with um, electronics as you work with um, with teachers individually, but I and I, I guess you know teachers in in different contexts um, and sort of relating it. Uh, I've got two two kids, both of them at secondary education in Spain, and it's very much the sort of the lower level. Remember this. Here's a test. Remember this. Here's a test. I just sort of wondered um, within the kind of the work that you do with electronics, how many whether you've worked with teachers perhaps working in state schools or where, where there's kind of a, an intense curriculum um, and trying to encourage them to, to sort of look at the higher level and how they've kind of managed to incorporate that. What, what kind of solutions you found, I suppose, is, is really the question. I do think that as teachers, we're often sort of uh, constrained in a, in a way by, by the curriculum. And of, and of course, I mean, um, in, in, I guess many of the panelists, they, they'll be working mm. in situations where they're very constrained by exams as well. So they're, the students are kind of working towards an end goal. Mm. Um, but I, I still feel that you can, you can implement uh, both mastery and developmental tasks, even when perhaps the, the, the main aim of the lesson is for the students to remember something. It's about them pushing them on to kind of apply what they, mm -hmm. what they learn. So I'm just thinking of a recent example where I was teaching students to write an email of complaint, which is a very boring lesson. They had an exam coming, coming up. Um, and of course, they had to learn the structure, they had to memorize certain phrases. So once again, we're operating on the understand level. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we gave them some choices about what they complained about, and they had to choose one product, one problem, um, one mm -hmm. consequence and one uh, solution that they wanted and they didn't match. So I think one person had a toaster that smelt really badly <laughs> and their marriage broke up and they wanted <laughs> compensation. So even though I had this, this quite traditional lesson where they had to, to really sort of, you know, write this, this 
perfect letter of complaint and memorize the structure and you mm -hmm. can still add certain things into that that will allow students to be a little bit more creative and yeah. um you know try and, and link things together it, it, it just takes time I think to to plan and reflect on what you're doing mm -hmm. but what I what I do find is when I'm planning lessons and I personally don't really like to write lesson plans <laughs> um is if I go through my activities in a lesson, like we did with the Jabberwocky lesson, is just work out, okay, is this mastery, is this developmental, and where is it on the taxonomy, so that I can right. um, introduce a, a level of, uh, you know, different, different levels in there. I can kind of reflect on what I've got to ensure that there's a mix of things. Okay. Yeah, okay. and it, it reminds me of like working with a teacher through Altonics actually that wanted to increase the challenge in their tasks. So I think task design is is a really kind of it's a nice area to work on with a teacher, um, getting those tasks to 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 reach developmental um, level rather than just mastery level. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it also incorporates like the way you give feedback to to teachers as well, to students as well. And so I've worked with with teachers through Eltonics talking about the different ways that you can give feedback and letting the students give feedback to each other as well and giving a much more emphasis on them mm -hmm. um but yeah I, th I think this goes back to original teacher training doesn't it and we need to kind of make sure that 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 that, that level of challenge is part of these teacher training courses initially yeah it's 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 the same in most countries i've worked in where the, the school system is very much at that kind of Mm. We, we've just got to answer the questions and pass the exam mm -hmm. but there yeah. are ways that you can implement yeah. more developmental tasks for sure okay thank you yeah no i guess it's i suppose yeah that initial teacher training in a lot of contexts is about subject knowledge being prepared yeah. to be able to answer the, the difficult yeah. grammar question or the whatever rather than the how do i actually get my students to you know be creative do this do that or whatever yeah. it's more just about yeah, yeah. learn it Okay, yeah, no, exactly. Good. Yeah, you need to learn it and get it right in the exam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a question, and again, this sort of I just want to go back to the website and some of the services that you offer and the training that you offer, and you've got sort of online teaching there. Um, and there's a, there's a question here. Um, there's three questions actually from from um, Mohammed. I'll just deal with one of them because we're not going to have time. I don't think for all of them, but. Um, the sort of mastery of development skills and the suitability for online teaching. Um, obviously, you know, the context at the minute, a lot of people are teaching remotely, either synchronously or, or asynchronously. Um, the session that you've given, do, have you seen that most of those activities will work sort of either lower level or higher level on online as, as, as well as on in face to face? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, simple answer is yes, absolutely. By utilizing mm -hmm. breakout rooms for great for, for group work, um, using the chat box for you know those hinge questions, mm -hmm. absolutely, it, it totally works in a virtual setting. And I think Sarah, you've actually done that Jabberwock lesson with your teenagers online as well, haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it was done online. Yes, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. um I, I did notice Paul that some people were saying you know my my students might choose the the easier questions that's okay uh, as well um mm -hmm. my students started to do this in the beginning and then thought ah this is way too easy I'm gonna go super yeah. spicy next time so um <laughs> yeah and, and that did work online this was with an online group of group of mm -hmm. learners yeah just okay. just talking about that spiciness as well it Okay, we're talking about confidence and challenge, but sometimes it's that that kind of like I'm just having a bad day, or I'm tired, or I've got an exam the next day, and I just want to take it easy for a bit. That that's okay too to choose like a, yeah. a one chili or two chilies, for example. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, what other questions? Uh, da, da, da. There's just an, yeah, it's a lot about choice. Um, I mean, there's there's a question about someone about saying about the it's more of a comment that the students are reluctant to speak I mean I would and then sort of suggestions for how to kind of counter that I would say probably watch the recording of this webinar to be honest because there's a lot of ideas um there you know I think and I think that idea of choice and not 
not making things threatening um, is, is, is a key thing, no? Would you, would you yeah. agree with that? And, and not knowing the answer yourself. Yes. <laughs> and having that dynamic in the class, you know, what, for example, you know, what, what, why is it important to be kind? My, my answer will be different to your answer and Sarah's answer. And, mm. and that's a really nice kind of, it's non-threatening. Mm. you know yeah. everything everything is encouraged every answer is encouraged mm. and and it's the opposite of what you were talking before about getting the right answer yeah. it's having that classroom dynamic where all answers are accepted yeah. and encouraged as well okay what about um using l1 i mean so let, let's say you've got a student and they kind of really want the sort of the spicy question but then in terms of the, the their ability linguistic kind of capabilities to answer it in a complex way in a, in a, in a second language do you, where, where do you sort of sit with that in terms of <laughs> them kind of get moving from okay I want the challenge but I don't quite have the capacity to answer it in a in the right way that's Is a it, really good question because what what these questions the, the the super spicy questions want the students to to be stretched right so you know uh, yeah. think critically and so on so I think that if they really want to answer that and they can only do that in their L1 mm -hmm. then why not especially if you're teaching a monolingual group and especially if the teacher knows the L1 mm -hmm. as well which I mean it you know it's so useful and then the teacher can either reformulate um, that in into English to, to help the students but I definitely would encourage students to answer in their L1 if they felt that they wanted that question but didn't mm -hmm. have the English level and maybe another thing that 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 I've always found useful as well is providing students with something called process language mm. um, it's not my target language for the lesson but it's sort of little speech bubbles that I might put around the room which which will it'll be a bit of functional language which will hopefully help them make express something so it could be well I think that the answer is dot mm. dot dot and then underneath it's I agree with you or I'm not so sure about that so maybe mm. introducing process language quite regularly into your classroom might also help with mm -hmm. help with that but L1 is something that I am fully behind okay. yeah. using using L1 where it's necessary in in the English classroom Claire I don't know if you you wanted yeah to I'm add. just I'm just thinking of myself as a, a sort of language learner learning Portuguese I and mean, maybe maybe I want to answer it but I can't but maybe that will motivate me to learn yeah language to be able to do that that that's um a, another yeah. kind of aspect of that as well I think okay Okay, um, we sort of run out of time. Are you right? Like, just want one more question because I think it's probably one yeah. that a few people will have around like larger only classes. It, uh, only if it's on, one chili. Okay, I think, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's one chili. If you think it's not, then tell me we will we'll, we'll skip over it. But um, so the, the, the concepts of the things that you've been talking about, someone's asking, um, Raja's asking about how that kind of translates into larger classes where you maybe got 35, 40 students in the class. I don't know if that's a one chili question or not but is it an, is it one you can answer <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a go have a go have a go <laughs> okay i well, personally I, I always with larger classes you're always gonna you, you're always gonna kind of lean on peer uh mm. pair and group work aren't you so you you'll be that's all part of the process as well getting getting groups to deliberate and question and answer together yeah. um like that that's the first thing that came into my head I don't know Sarah if you've got anything I, I think it it, it actually works I mean th there are so many challenges with teaching large large groups in any case in terms of classroom management and so on but I think what when, when we're you know what what large groups really need is a lot of motivation and peer teaching and this kind of including this kind of questioning or including sort of walls of wonder really helps mm -hmm. with with this yeah. um and as you you know as Claire said it, it's not it's not about the teacher knowing everything so in larger yeah. classes having the things like the 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 pose pause pounce bounce or the abc it works really well because you're trying to bring in as many 
um, students as possible. And, you know, the level of choice can be done within groups. So if you've got, say, 40 students in a, in a class and they're all working in groups of five, then that group of five could work on a particular challenge and another group of five could work on something else. And mm -hmm. then getting, you know, giving students roles, perhaps, you know, one gives you the feedback, one checks that everybody's on task, that kind of that kind yeah. of thing. So I think it can work in any class size, but of course, teachers with with larger classes do face um, yeah. as, as a kind of problem. Yeah, different challenges for sure. When you've got group work going on in that context, though, that just kind of takes the pressure off you to be front of class and, and the one with all the answers and trying to kind of assess mm -hmm. everybody gives you the chance to walk around, to sit, to listen, to facilitate, to support mm -hmm. um, and also give like really nice feedback on what they're doing as well. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Lovely, thank you. That was so much really great and lots of fantastic ideas. Really, really enjoyed that actually. It's um, a great. great way to start the year with our first webinar. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. Claire, thank we you. really enjoyed it. Yeah, good. thank you. Thank That's you for good. everyone's comments as well. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank yeah, you so much. We, we were very nervous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need to be. There you go. You see, it was great. Lots of, yeah, lots of fantastic comments. Everyone um, seems to have really enjoyed it. So thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone for your comments and your input as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll end it there. We will be back in a couple of weeks for our latest webinar. For information about anything upcoming on our webinars, do visit Teaching English. I think when this ends, it should magically open up for you on Teaching English. And you can just go to the webinars section and find out what's coming up. Um, certificates and everything I have put links into the chat uh, I can see there are questions um, more instructions will be in the thank you email that you'll get tomorrow so um, if you can't click on links please do be patient and wait till tomorrow and you'll get the links then and that's pretty much all we've got time for so thanks again Sarah thanks Claire and um, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you again soon I hope um, take care bye bye everyone. thank you so much bye everyone bye bye, bye.